Forgotten Populist, When Farmers Turn Left to Save Democracy by Steve Babson, is a brief history book about the populist movement of the 1890s. While politicians on the left and right may use the term populist today, it's a distortion of the founding principles of the movement. Stay tuned to learn more about the original populist. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. And today, I'll talk with Steve Babson about Forgotten Populists. I requested and was provided with a copy of the book, but this video is not sponsored. Now, a bit about the author. Steve Babson is a labor educator and union activist. He received his doctorate in U.S. history from Wayne State University, where he worked as an instructor and extension program coordinator in the Labor Studies Center. He's the author of six books and joins us to talk about his latest, Forgotten Populist, When Farmers Turned Left to Save Democracy. Steve, welcome to Some Books Considered. A pleasure to be here. Well, Steve, as you explain in the book, the motivation behind the original populist movement was very different from how people are using the term populist today. And I want to get into that in just a moment. But first of all, let's go back to the origination of the movement. Who were the populists and what were they trying to achieve? Well, they were organizing in the 1890s. Really, it started in the 1880s with the Farmers Alliance uh, and with the Knights of Labor. And what they were addressing was the enormous inequality uh, that followed from the organization of huge corporations after the Civil War between 1870, 1890, massive corporations like Standard Oil, Carnegie Steel, uh, you name it, McCormick Reaper. These were companies that were establishing a new kind of industrial capitalism, and it had many benefits, uh, the extension of railroad service and all kinds of cheaper mass-produced goods, but at the same time, it also was producing enormous inequality uh, and a real gap in power between a population that was increasingly dependent on these corporations for goods and services, but had little access to how to make that work in their favor. So these huge corporations were often engaging in price gouging in monopoly practices. They were uh, undercutting wages and cutting, uh, basically suppressing unions and suppressing farmer organizations. And so the populists, they called themselves the People's Party, and they wanted to address this imbalance of power. They wanted to fortify the government with democratic reforms uh, so that that government could match the power of big business and act on behalf of the people rather than uh, the mega rich who were coming to power. As you tell in the book, there were various groups of people that wanted to create this change, including a large portion of the agricultural industry and also rural America. And Steve, I was born in Kansas and lived much of my life there. So I noted with interest that Kansas was a big part of this movement. So in the book, you spotlight some of the leaders from Kansas. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Kansas actually was one of the most powerful parts of the populist movement, uh, and in fact, one control of the state government at several points. Uh, across the country, the populace elected about 50 members of Congress, uh, six governors. Uh, and it was in Kansas in particular that they had considerable success mobilizing farmers uh, on behalf of a new way of approaching government regulation, not just bureaucracy, but a, a democratically empowered government that could match the power of big business. And so here you had a a range in, in Kansas of folks addressing the fact that many farmers were falling into tenancy and burdened with enormous debt uh, in Kansas. Over a third of all farmers were tenant farmers by the end of the 1890s. And so uh, burdened as well with heavy debt, uh, mortgages and foreclosures and a whole range of issues as aggravated, especially by the uh, economic depression that swept across the country. Uh, in the early 1890s, 20% unemployment. And in that context, in Kansas and elsewhere, the populace wanted to establish a new approach that would provide assistance to farmers and workers, but especially farmers, that was their focal point, uh, by broadening uh, the money supply. That was one of the key issues. Up until this point in Kansas and elsewhere, uh, credit was very expensive. Uh, the bankers wanted to limit the supply of money to what was um, amounted to a very scarce reserve of gold. Uh, 
the gold standard was their way of restricting the supply of money, raising interest rates, uh, and burdening farmers with enormous debt. Uh, Kansas in particular, after the drought that began in 1887 and the collapse of many of these mortgage companies, it was very difficult to find a loan to buy equipment or supplies for less than 40% interest, 1887 and, and thereafter. And so what the populace wanted to do was to expand the money supply with government-issued bills and coinage of silver to make credit more accessible and bearable by farmers who also needed help regulating the railroads. It was in Kansas, it was more expensive to ship corn and wheat to Chicago than the price that product would actually fetch on those markets in, in Chicago. So they wanted to regulate the railroads, force them to actually provide an affordable service. And if they wouldn't, then take it over and make it a public enterprise, a public enterprise operated on behalf of farmers. And that made a lot of sense because the, far, the railroads had been built with public resources in the first place. They were heavily subsidized, tax breaks, uh, subsidies for every mile of track laid, uh, and in the gifting of land across the United States, over 175 million acres of land was simply given to the railroads. That's the equivalent the size of Texas given away to the railroads as a, as a gift, really. And so the populace argued, well, with that kind of public support, why not make it a public enterprise on behalf of working people and farmers rather than on behalf of enriching an already extraordinarily wealthy uh, corporate ruling class? The populists were not able to achieve all of their goals, but what would you say were the greatest successes of the movement? Well, what they did was, uh, this is very interesting, because uh, at that time, both the Republican and Democratic parties uh, favored this new class of robber barons, as they were called at the time by folks who did not welcome these changes. Uh, and it was the populists who tried to first pressure the, both Republicans and the Democrats to realign themselves with the people rather than the corporate rich. They failed to do that. At that time, there were no primaries in either major party. And so party bosses could pretty much exclude and force out any dissident voice. And so that made it necessary to organize a third party at that time. May not be necessary now to make that kind of change, but that's what was necessary back then. And the populists were very successful as a third party, but uh, basically they were outflanked in effect by the Democrats. They in particular saw what was happening, that the populists were winning an enormous amount of popular support, particularly in the South, particularly in the Great Plains. And so in 1896, they adopted part of the populist program uh, and ran a man named William Jennings Bryan uh, for president. He was not a populist, but he adopted some of that program. And he swept the election, by the way, in 1896 in Kansas. He won Kansas and many other states, got about 47% of the vote, but fell just shy of winning. Uh, and But nevertheless, set in motion a process that over time, Democrats in particular, but also some Republicans, began to adopt new approaches to regulating uh, corporations to saying, well, we can't just give them an unfettered free hand to do as they please because they will engage in price gouging, monopoly practices, cutting wages. We need to regulate them. We need to enforce standards upon them. Keep in mind, by the way, that at this time, there were no safety standards in, in the railroading business. Every year, 2,500 workers would die on the railroads across the United States, 20,000 injured. So you needed safety standards, you needed regulation of prices, you needed regulation of labor issues to enforce upon them standards that would serve the interests of people and farmers. And in that regard, the long, over the long term, the populace had an enormous positive impact in a whole range of ways we take for granted today. I'll give you one example. Uh, senators used to be appointed by state legislators. And that meant that they would be bought and sold according to which uh, particular interest group had accumulated enough money to buy their way into power. And the populace wanted election of senators. They wanted voting rights for women who were uh, denied the vote. And in fact, the Kansas populace endorsed uh, votes for women in 1894, one of the first states to do so. And it was the populace who won votes for women in Colorado and Idaho, the first states to actually enact voting rights for women. In the South, the populace favored voting rights for African-Americans. Uh, 
because they saw the need for a coalition of white and black farmers who could together unify around their common economic interests. They did not go so far, by the way, as to endorse desegregation of social life, but they were the first major party to take that step and say, we need to unify black and white farmers. We need to give votes to women. We need to elect senators. And the only way that a government can fortify itself to oppose the abuses of big business is by broadening that democratic base. I'm talking with Steve Babson. The book is Forgotten Populist, When Farmers Turn Left to Save Democracy. And it sounds like they accomplished a lot in their time, and there's a legacy from that movement that still carries forward to today. However, one of the things you point out in the book, and I understand was part of the impetus for writing this book, is that there are those who are taking on the populist mantle today who represent opposite political positions. So how can the left and the right both claim to be populist? Well, yeah, it's very strange. It got particularly bizarre in 2016 when both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders were both being described as populists. I mean, how can two men with such very different political perspectives be given the same label as if somehow they had something in common? And really all they have in common is a rhetoric about the people versus some version of an elite. And in the case of Bernie Sanders and others, they are closer to what the original populists were about. Um, But there are many politicians who will adopt the rhetoric of supporting the people against whatever kind of elite they care to identify. But they, in practice and in terms of their actions, are not really populist, but they use that rhetoric. And so there are folks who are you know, supportive of the status quo who see anyone who uses that rhetoric as a danger, whether on the right or left. Uh, and so they, in a broad stroke, kind of broad brush, they dismiss both as being unreliable uh, and somehow common uh, a, a adherence to demagogic kinds of approaches. You write that the idea of a right-wing populist is an oxymoron. Right. Tell us more about that. Well, I mean, if the populists were about uh, expanding democracy and regulating corporations and even taking over the railroads and on behalf of the public operating them as a public enterprise, they also, by the way, thought that the private banking system was corrupt and devoted to high interest rates, sometimes 40 percent, not the banks, but mortgage companies and some of the merchants in the South were were charging 40, 50, 60 percent interest on loans to, to folks. The populace wanted to empower the post office to provide low cost one to two percent loans for people and decentralize finance and credit and make it available to people on a broader basis. And so on that on that notion, how can you talk about right wingers who want to su- suppress uh, actually that kind of initiative who want to deregulate business, who want to favor large corporations, calling them populist is an oxymoron. It's the opposite of what it meant in the 1890s. Well, Steve, when you were describing the conditions that the populists were fighting against in the 1890s, you point out in the book that many of those same issues exist today in terms of economic inequality, the power of corporations, etc., is there a place for a new populist movement today? I would hope so. I would, I would want to see some kind of effort to focus on a, a priority that places people first. Workers uh, and working people should be actually the front and center priority for a political organization and a movement that would seek to restore some of the things we lost from the New Deal. And uh, I'm kind of old school in that regard. I look back at the New Deal providing a social safety net, protections for labor and farmers. Uh, I see that as a positive thing. And I would hope we could actually turn back to some of those ideas, but also then modernize them and then update them. Uh, Anti-monopoly practices, I think, are important. And a policy that addresses Google and Amazon and other modern-day monopolies, I think, is a very appropriate approach uh, to think rethinking how we empower people with the support of a democratic government. I'm not talking about government bureaucracy. I'm talking about an expanded democratic base for uh, reinvigorating an idea that the economy really should be serving people first 
and not profits first. You write that when the original populist movement formed, they were not able to work within either of the two main political parties, and they, they had to form a third party. Now, for a new populist movement to work today, would it require that same third party scenario? I would not. I would hope not, because uh, the difference between today and back then is that in both parties, and particularly, I think, relevant in the Democratic Party, there is a primary system that allows new voices and challenging voices to actually raise uh, alternative approaches and bring a, a different kind of sentiment to the political party so that uh, we would have then the possibility of contesting within either of the major parties uh, for a new approach. The problem with a third party is that the American political system is a what's called a winner-take-all system. It's not like a parliamentary system where if you get 10 to 15 percent of the vote, you participate in a coalition that would then choose the prime minister. In the United States, you either win it all or you're completely irrelevant. And uh, I think, therefore, what we have to talk about is a movement within either of the major political parties, but most plausibly within the Democratic Party, uh, to reinitiate a kind of priority given to supporting the people, supporting working people. Well, Steve, there's much more in the book than we can talk about in this brief interview. So what would you say are some of the key insights that you hope people will take from the book about this populist movement from the 1890s? Well, I hope they would see that uh, our history is a compelling and dramatic story, and certainly the populists are part of that drama, and that it would, it would give them confidence in their ability to actually change the world. Uh, too often we feel powerless and isolated, and I would urge people to rethink that, to join with their neighbors, their co-workers in their communities, and start to develop at a local level first, but linking with others across the country for a new kind of approach uh, that will uh, basically do what the populists tried to do in the 1890s and successfully change the political terrain. And that is, we have to take action, we have to t put ourselves out there uh, with our co-workers, with our community members, and, and fight for change. And the populace did that, and it made a huge difference. To learn more, the book is Forgotten Populist, When Farmers Turned Left to Save Democracy. It's by Steve Babson. Steve, thank you very much for talking with me today. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure to be here. If you'd like to purchase Forgotten Populist, I've placed a link for you in the description below. And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors and a wide variety of topics, be sure to like, subscribe, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.